Hello everyone, welcome back to the Clara CFO Group channel. Today we are interviewing Greg Crabtree. Now, that name, you might not know it, it might, might not be a household name just yet, um, but Greg Crabtree wrote a very important book, a very helpful book for small business owners. If you do not have this book, I would highly recommend it. And I'm gonna let you listen to Greg first before you make that decision um, on whether or not it's something that you would like to check out for your business. But I just wanna tell you that Greg is somebody that I highly respect in the small business finance accounting world. His teaching, specifically the books that he's written, this is 1.0, there is a 2.0 book. Um, have been really extremely beneficial in both communicating what you need to be paying attention to in your numbers and also just kind of bringing concepts out of sort of accounting realm and bringing them into very practical implementation for the small business owner. So Greg has a wealth of experience. His entire career has been spent in finance, in accounting, helping small business owners learn how to be more profitable. So this interview is all talking about his experience and what small business owners need to be paying attention to. These, the, I mean, guys, his, his knowledge and his depth of knowledge is incredible. So he is an author, a speaker. He has spent his whole life in accounting like I just mentioned. And he is also a trainer for lots of global organizations. I actually got connected with him because I'm part of the Entrepreneur Organization Accelerator Program. And he has been involved in that, we call it EO, Entrepreneur Entrepreneur Organization, EO. EO is a global organization and he's been a part of that for years. And he actually was delivering a training to the Accelerator um, participants. And I was like, oh my gosh, Greg Crabtree is like teaching. Um, so I had to hop on that opportunity and then I was able to invite him in to talk to you guys um, about you know what, what small business owners really need to think about. So um, he has just devotes a lot of his time now into training and to teaching all over the world. Um, and you'll hear some of those stories and things during this interview. So please stay tuned, buckle up, feel free to you know turn this on while you're driving somewhere. You don't necessarily need to look at our faces while this is happening happening. You could listen to this like a podcast if you want to, but um, I would love for you to soak up the knowledge of Greg Crouchy in this interview. And then if you want to go to the next level, go ahead and grab the book. We'll put resources and links in the description box below. Okay, you guys, so this is kind of a long interview, but stick with it. There's lots of gold in here. All right, let's get to it. Great. We'll go ahead and get started then. Um, first, Greg Crabtree, thank you so much for being here today on the channel. Yeah. Thanks, Anna. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Yeah. Well, um, I would love to hear. So I knew your name before I ever got to um, participate in one of your classes. And then now we're talking here. So I had seen your name because of this book, <laughs> Simple yep. Numbers, Straight Talk, Big Profits. Um, so I would love to hear how you got to a place of writing books and what your career yep. trajectory looked like to get you to that place. Well, I, I, you know, I think as, as CPAs, you know, we we do a lot of technical work, but you know, as we interface with clients, you really become invested in their success and how to make them successful. And you know, the the profession gets tied up in you know profession things that that you know the way I like to describe it is as a general rule, us accountants have the clients working for us instead of us working for the clients. And, and I've always had a heart for the entrepreneur. And, you know, I, I had a significant experience in 2001 where a client of mine had, had moved from Huntsville, Alabama, where my practice was, and moved to Atlanta and uh, to get better access to talent. And uh, he called me up one day and he says, hey, I've run into this YEO group and you need to come to one of our learning events. I go, you know, it's a four hour drive. And it's like, ah, I don't know. He says, yeah, you have, you have to come. You have to come. And and so I go to the event and um, and it was, you know, transformational because I signed up on the spot. Little did I know I made the requirements by one month. I would have aged out had I waited another month to decide to join. Oh, wow. um, yeah. And and we didn't we didn't eliminate the age requirement in EO until probably about five, six years ago. And so and just for people listening, EO. You know, it's the entrepreneurs organization. Okay. Um, and, you know, it's a, um, there, there's similar organizations out there, YPO, Young Presidents Organization, 
um, and uh, EO um, Entrepreneurs Organization. So we're global organization about I think about 15,000 members worldwide. But I mean, at that time, I had a million dollar practice in Huntsville, Alabama, a couple of partners and you know, we're, we're doing the thing of trying to do a little bit of everything. All of our clients were in Huntsville, Alabama. And singularly through this experience through EO, uh, today our practice unit's six and a half million. 90% of that work is not in Huntsville, Alabama. We have a reach. We have clients in Australia, Southeast Asia, Latin America, Canada, um, and, you know, still vast majorities in the U.S., but it's all over the U.S. I, and, uh, and, and so, you know, practitioners ask me all the time, well, how, how did you find clients in all those places? And it's like, well, it really starts with coming to a belief about what you think works. And, and I owe this to my EO forum. So in EO, you have chapter level events, you have global events, but you have a monthly forum experience. And the beauty about it is it's not like a, a business networking group. You're tied to confidentiality. Uh, you, can't, you can't do business with each other based on forum rules. So it's a safe environment. And so my nine other forum mates basically told me what sucks about us, uh, us accountants. Because when I asked them the question, I said, how many of you would recommend your current accountant? The answer was zero. So in a, in a net promoter score valuation of that, our profession did not score well. We are a necessary, but it's not sufficient. It's not what the market needs. And I said, okay, well, what, what is it that the market needs? And, I, and, I got, and they said, well, first off, nobody wants the tax day surprise. So whether it's April 15th or it could be worse, could be October 15th, you know, it's like, okay, well, I, I said, I, I got some ideas. I think I know how to fix that one. Says, what else? Says, well, we don't like being billed by the hour. Now, for whoever's listening to this, I'll give you the statement that I learned from this. Because the guy that, that got me into EO, he was an engineer by trade. And he was always hammering me about saying, you accountants are all the same. You know, I ask you how much something costs. And he say, well, it depends on how much time I have in it. And he says, time is not a unit of value. It's a unit of cost. And, and, and so, you know, you ought to be able to quote quicker about what you do. And these guys confirmed it. They said, we, like, we, want, we don't like being billed by the hour. And what I've since learned and what we teach our, our, our clients who used to do hourly billing is this. If you bill by the hour, there's only two possible outcomes. You either gave away your expertise or you charge for your ignorance. Neither one of those are good. And, and so, yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that, that's the big learning. Now, sure. to bill on a fixed price basis, what it requires is you to have an understanding of the market value of what you do. And you have to have skill to manage productivity and outcomes. And, and billing by the hour is a lazy ass way of managing a business mm -hmm. because you're, you know, well, it's just, we're just going to bill for whatever time it is and we'll get to the end of it. And we'll negotiate. We'll knock some off. And that's a horrible way of doing business because you're not defending the value of what you do. So anyway, so we agreed to that and said, okay, well, what else? And then this is the last one. This is the, the indictment of a profession. They said, oh, by the way, you see hundreds of businesses, most intimate details. As the accountant, we know, we see more than any other practitioner of any other, uh, other uh, uh, skill set that if we, as we interact with a client. And, and many times we know more about the client than their spouse does. Mm -hmm. And, and so, um, you know, it said, you, you see the most intimate details of all these businesses. You ought to have some idea of what works and what doesn't. Now, as practitioners, we all have anecdotal ideas, but we don't have developed ideas. So this is why you write a book. The first thing, you know, so early on, um, there were people in, in the EO universe, you know, Vern Harness being one of them. Uh, Ron Hollis, who was the guy that got me into EO, both of them really said, you know, they, they delivered on this idea that if you think you know something unique, you owe it to the world to put it in a book and share it. Mm. Now, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a kid from a chicken farm in Alabama, an unknown author. Nobody knows who the hell I am. But why would I write a book? Well, it starts with a belief. I think I know something that can help. And I started working on it and I quickly got to writer's block. And then I ended up kind of a fortuitous event, I ended up getting uh, uh, asked to sit on the EO global board because probably my best skill set is I can explain big numbers in small words. 
uh, to entrepreneurs. And, and so the, 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 I was the only accountant in the EO universe at that time that could really kind of talk numbers. And I really took the same concepts I used with my business clients at the time and applied it to EO's financial situation and, and all those. And, and, and it really stuck. And so they asked me to be on the board. So I served on the EO Global Board, which was a very, very time consuming thing from 2006 to 2009. But it also helped me get out of Huntsville, Alabama periodically. I still live here, still operate here, mm-hmm. but I, I, I didn't have a passport until 2003. And, and since 2003, I've gone to 42 countries. I've delivered my content in 15 countries uh, around the world. And it gave me an opportunity. I love testing the theory because mm-hmm. it, I, I do have this fundamental belief that business is business. You know, and there's differences in capitalization uh, requirements in different economies and those things. You know, but at the end of the day, it's about, hey, let's, you know, let's do something useful and find a way to get paid fairly for it. And let's do it again. And, and that happens all around the world every day, every moment. And, and so these were just huge opportunities. And so I, when I got off the board, I had about 12 weeks a year that I'd been spending on board service that I didn't. This was the strategic decision. It, I, I didn't put it back in the business. And I said, OK, I'm going to work on this material. So I tested it doing some presentations and I took those presentations. And that was the what created the first book, Simple Numbers, mm-hmm. Straight Talk, Big Profits, that, you know, proud to say, I mean, we're probably between all forms of, of Kindle and, um, you know, hardback and all that. I mean, the book sold probably a little over 60,000 copies, you know, at this yeah. point. You know, and 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 so it's and recently I uh, went in the recording studio and I've recorded the audio book for both books. So I followed it up and finally in 2020 with Simple Numbers 2.0. So I read both books and um, it's pretty daunting to go into the recording studio and read something you wrote 10 years ago, word for word. <laughs> and, you know, I, I, I got to the end of it and had this little private moment to myself of going, man, that's a pretty good book. <laughs> and, it's, and it's like because I was there was a little trepidation of you know I, it's like ah oh, you know I wish I'd have said it this way or I wish I'd you know it's like no it was it's good and, yeah and and actually I even saw vestiges of things that I had forgotten that I put in the first book that was the beginning themes of what the second book is really about which mm-hmm. is how to run a business as an investment of here's my capital requirements for various models and here's the return on investment that I must get. And it's about getting a return on investment and respecting your business as your most valuable investment you'll ever have rather Mm -hmm. than destroying it to do other things that aren't as valuable. Mm -hmm. And, And so that's been a common discussion that I've tried to communicate to my clients over the years of the, the value that you're creating with your business and, and if you can catch that idea early in your business life and then drive it forward, it, it becomes a really phenomenal outcome. Absolutely. I think the um, I what I see oftentimes is people are thinking of their businesses almost as a job. It's just about making some income and sort of leave on the table the potential long term value of what could be created with some certain investments. And maybe that means less money comes out of the business right away. But if you're doing it strategically and putting putting forth the effort um, when in, in thinking about it that way from the beginning, it can be a game changer. Well, there was a great article in Wall Street Journal in the late 90s that looked at Subway franchises back when Subway would do a single unit franchise. And they said, they analyzed and they said, well, a single unit Subway is a great way to have a $25,000 a year job with all the headaches of ownership because there, there is only so many people you can get past that cash register on a one location. Right. But now if you have 10 of them, okay, now we're talking like a business. And so as a business owner who's struggling, you, you got to ask yourself, did I, did I get rooked into buying a single unit subway and I need to rethink my strategy or, okay, I've got something that can scale and grow. And now I just need to go through the sequences to make that happen. Um, yeah. Well, I'd love to talk about that a little bit more because, mm-hmm. um, you know, I, I, one of the things that I run into the most is that our people are, 
building a business and um, either at the very beginning, they're putting all their time and energy, you know, sweat equity into the mm -hmm. business. They're running it. They're, they're saying, Oh, I won't take a paycheck. I won't take a paycheck. And they're, you know, kind of building it up. But um, at a cer certain point, they stop paying themselves altogether or they're not paying themselves enough. Um, I'd be curious about mm -hmm. your thoughts on owners paying themselves and when is it okay to just rely on sweat equity? And then maybe when is that, like, how long, how long is that sustainable? I'd love to hear some thoughts on that. Well, you know, and that's really the first chapter of the first book. And I call it removing distortions because the biggest distortion, especially to a business under 5 million is owner compensation and just the, the brain damage that we, we all deal with that number. Because I'm a, I'm a big fan of I want I want data to speak truth. Now mm -hmm. truth, you know, I'm, you know, if, if you can't handle a cruel basis accounting, um, you know, okay, well, truth. I still have truth in cash basis, but you know, what what is that truth in profitability? But the the biggest distortion that kills most business owners that we start working with is they're they're trying to save payroll taxes. Now, most of them are just lying to themselves because they're taking it out of the business as a distribution because they got to have money to live off of. Mm -hmm. And they're telling themselves that, oh, I'm taking a, a low salary or no salary. But in reality, yeah, they are. I mean, because you got to have money to live on. And and so our our philosophy is very straightforward. I had a, a discussion with an attorney client of ours this morning and he, he'd, he'd gone to some seminar with this highfalutin tax attorney and he's going through the, the techniques of, yeah, you know, you need to keep your salary down and you can save this payroll taxes. And I go, he's an idiot, you know, because he, here's the thing. Number one is, I, you know, yeah, I, he's not an idiot about the math, but what he's missing is the big elephant in the room that he's not paying attention to. And it's called human behavior. And so if I was going to describe what I do every day, I'm not an accountant. I'm a behavioral economist mm -hmm. because what I really focus on is how do I get my clients who happen to be humans and their employees who happen to be humans achieve the best version of themselves. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so the, the math is kind of the mechanism that they see it and report on it and respond to it. Think of it like this. So, Hannah, if, if you decided to go run a, a mile and, and run your best time ever, if you, it, you know, if you don't have a, a stopwatch, if you don't carry a runner's watch to look at your time splits, how, how successful do you think you would be in accomplishing that goal? Not at all. <laughs> you, you won't. You won't because you, you've got to have feedback to say, am I on pace? Mm -hmm. Am I, you know, and, and on pace works both ways. Am I working too hard that I'll run out of energy and not finish? Or am I working hard enough to, that I, that I'm, am I getting to my splits fast enough that I'll eventually, I, I, I won't be so far behind. I can't catch up. Mm -hmm. That that's, that's the working world, you know, that, that we live in. And so when you look at all these human behavioral aspects, we have a simple rule. You get paid a salary for what you do. You get a return on what you own. And this is the first error that every entrepreneur makes. I must have a clear distinction because not, and, and you, you'll probably say, well, I don't know how much I ought to pay myself. Really? I mean, come on. You know, I mean, if you got run over by a bus today and your family decided to keep running your business, I guarantee you they can find somebody to do what you do. And there's an amount that that person is willing to take as pay. Now, some of you might need to be replaced with two people and some of us can be improved upon and replaced by half a person. <laughs> so, so just, just understand that this is the harsh reality of what we face of, are you adding value in your employee role for the, the role that you take in your business? And, and so if I, once we get that, that role established and you're paid a, a true market wage, if you decide to skip paychecks, that's just a funding mechanism for you to loan money back to the business. Now, granted, I don't want you to pay tax on it, but I still want to account for it as compensation because I want you to see those big brackets or the red numbers at the bottom line, because until you have made an acceptable level of profit and covered your salary at market rate, you are not successful. Mm. 
Bottom line. Bottom line. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I can, I can look at profit with some money and go, wow, you know, it looks like you've got a 20% profit margin. And then once you take out, you take out all of the distributions that the owner has had to be, you know, pulling mm -hmm. from the business, they're actually in almost a negative situation. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious what you do specifically for people who are sole proprietors, taxes, yeah. sole proprietors, they're running off of a schedule C and, you know, they don't put themselves on payroll, for example, yep. you know, they're just taking distributions as their, you know, pay. How do you um, recommend they look at their numbers? The, so part of it is make sure you communicate what you do to your tax preparer, mm -hmm. but I still want you to take a draw that's like your salary, have an account in your, your books that is that fixed number. And I want you to take it on a fixed basis, mm -hmm. you know, and because in, your, your first key performance indicator is did you miss any paychecks? I mean, that, that's, that, that's really a good entry level key performance indicator. And so once you book it there, then the uh, the accountant, you know, just ignores that line as an expense, you know, to the Schedule C, um, you know, so that that's really not that big of a deal. It, the, the same thing happens if you're an LLC taxed as a partnership and you're working in the business, you get a guaranteed payment. Mm -hmm. Now, the way the tax form is prepared, that guaranteed payment goes in as an expense, but it's essentially a draw against the business. But if you account for it that way, you're going to see it and you're going to get the true profitability of the profit the business makes. And so some of the people listening to this might be in a franchise. One of the things that just drives me up the wall about franchise discussion is this concept of ODI, owner's discretionary income. Hmm. It's like it is just the dumbest idea ever because what they're trying to lure you into doing is they're showing you the profit out of the business is the compensation that you need to do the job that you're doing. Well, if you ever try to grow that business to where you're not working in it every day and you just own it as an investor and you've got a professional manager running it, well, that's not ODI, that's not owner's discretionary income because you're paying somebody to do that job. And I, I, I just I'm just categorically opposed to that that concept because it's it's it, it's a job it's a job with all the headaches of ownership is what you're tying yourself into. Hmm. Yeah, and I I'm I'd be curious what you would think um, if you have somebody who's working full time running right. their business. Do you have any kind of minimums that you would think like nobody should be making under a certain amount? for running a business, or do you think it depends on industry? No, no, we just we just pull a wage survey for the job. And, mm -hmm. and so now we our our practice, we we invest in a really high end uh, economic research institute salary assessor program mm -hmm. so we can we can pull wage surveys for any job. And so typically a startup entrepreneur, you know, I'm not probably going to pull a CEO or president position. I'm going to mm -hmm. pull operations manager or general manager, mm -hmm. uh, you know, something like that, you know, for that that business manager role. But once you get to a million you're probably going to pull either a, a salary for a president or um, now w one of the things is, so, you know, if you're in a, um, a professions industry, say medical profession. So we look at medical practices is the, the owner is the direct labor because they're a producer. Mm -hmm. And so what you're really trying to do is that there's a, there's a market value that's fairly well established in most of those, those skill sets. And I'm trying, even though I might pay yourself on a production basis, just like you'd pay another practitioner, but you're not going to know how to grow a business. So I'll give you a great example. We had a, 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 a pra medical practitioner in the Midwest that, you know, he was, he was just paying himself a finite number. And then he brought in another doc who asked for market wage. Well, you know, they, they grew in top line, but the bottom line went down a bit. And, you know, and, and when we had our first session with him, he said, you know, I feel like I'm working harder and making less money. And this is, yeah, it's because you're paying this guy too much. I said, mm -hmm. He agreed. He agreed to a, a, a pay rate that really is not acceptable in the market for what this guy produced to. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so, you know, he just got a bad deal and ended up letting the doc go and started making more money. Um, and, and, you know, and, and that, that happens, you're going, you know, when you don't know, and you try something, okay, well, you know, go back to the drawing board, fix it and move on. Mm -hmm. And, and, but see, he distorted things in his thinking because he wasn't paying himself mm -hmm. a market rate. 
And so if I'm a producer and I'm building my business by creating other producers like me, I distort reality if I'm not paying myself like I'm going to pay somebody else who does the same thing I do. Mm -hmm. I'm fine if they do that as long as they're profitable. Absolutely. And and that's really important when it comes to your other employees as well, because you could be building your, you know, building your business and potentially, you know, pricing your services, let's say your service provider based on, you know, your cousin that came in and started working for you. And that person, you know, was willing to take $15 an hour, but it's actually a $25 an hour job if you were to go out and hire anybody else. Mm -hmm. Um, So you could be potentially building your whole business on non-market wages, which can kind of destroy the business model in a lot of ways. So it does. Yeah. Well, you also, well, you're on a good point there because I also see it on the customer side, especially in a small business. Um, I I got news for you. There's stupid customers out there that overpay for stuff. You just can't, (laughs) you just can't find enough of them. And so when, (laughs) when, when you build your business off of the stupid customer who just has no concern of money, Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and you wonder why you can't grow your business. It's because I, I, I have this unicorn that not repeatable. And so, I, and it destroys my thinking about how everything else works. Mm-hmm. And especially you see this in businesses that have large, that they only have one or two customers. You know, they, they have one dominant customer or two dominant customers, and then a lot of little stuff. And when we do segment analysis, which we show a technique of how to do that in the 2.0 book, when you look at that segment analysis by customer, you start to realize, I, you know, I, 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 I'm not making money. You, you find that you're either not making money on the big things to be able to do the profit, profitable stuff on the small things, or it's the vice versa. But it's almost never uniform in rate of performance, you know, across small to big. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and, and people just don't see it because there's there's not really good you know we, we've developed our simple numbers technique that we think we're pretty good at it when we can get the client to tag the data but a lot of people just are, are really behind the curve to be able to have that segment view of profitability because i'm not trying to complete a PL all the way you know I, i'm an anti-allocator i do not like allocating cost so mm-hmm. i'm just looking for the margin creation on those segments and, and overhead expenses, they, they are what they are. They're, they're actually not that variable. They're, they're going to be kind of the same, you know, without major changes in volume. And so if you really get good at targeting margin performance on a monthly basis and even down to a weekly basis, those are the, the businesses that really start to scale and, and, and achieve good utilization of their resources. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, w- I, I am constantly surprised at, you know, businesses that are touching lots of, or they have lots of different revenue streams, how much they don't look into, you know, really, what does it cost to produce this one service line? What does it cost to produce this one? What does it cost? And part of that is just an accounting setup issue. Mm -hmm. And then part of it is just nobody's really like told them to sit down and look at it one by one. Um, Because you could have a whole business segment just completely dragging down your whole your your whole business yeah we, we've started doing a lot more when i do presentations for industry groups or mastermind groups we've kind of taken our content and and this will probably be future books that we'll put out that are kind of more targeted is really kind of a playbook you know for an industry mm-hmm. hey if you want to operate at the top of your game here's the playbook that here's how to tag data here's the the critical data and it's a lot of stuff that may not it, it's not what industry groups are actually looking at because those people are just, it, it may look great, but it's, we were on a call with a client this morning. It's in the, the veterinary uh, practice industry and, you know, their corporate office had, had sent one of their locations that we coach, uh, you know, a, 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 their dashboard. Look good, meaningless. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, it's, it's like, come on, folks, you know, can you, can you look at some better indications, you know, of data? And, and, and really, I think a lot of it is, is, you know, we focus so one thing I will tell your audience is, is, you know, the number one thing is, is productivity of labor. There's not mm-hmm. a single business that operates in the world today that does not make money off of, off of productivity of the labor input. Labor is not a subset of revenue. It's not a percentage of revenue. That's not the way to look at it. I spend labor to get output. Mm-hmm. And if I spend money on labor that doesn't create output, it's called 
loss in mm-hmm. losing money. Mm-hmm. And, and so that's the reason why our signature labor efficiency ratio concept is based on not revenue output either. It's about gross margin output because mm-hmm. not every dollar of revenue is equal in, in value. And, and, and revenue is a slippery snake. And it, yeah. it's just, and it's one everybody gravitates to because it's, it's the easiest number to calculate, but it's the hardest number to ultimately analyze because it, it, it can be distorted in so many ways. Definitely. And I mean, it's deceiving. It's totally a vanity metric of, mm-hmm. you know, until you, until you can look at everything else, it's, it's kind of, I hate how we always like talk about businesses in their revenue numbers too, because it's just, it's a lot of times not an indicator, indicator of any kind of health. Um, on the labor efficiency, it's interesting. I, I like, I really like that concept in the book. I was talking to a client recently where um, she was like, Hey, I'm not sure if I need to pay my bookkeeper to do this work for me. It's $500 a month. I'm just really not sure it makes sense to spend money on this, you know, and we were talking through it and <laughs> she has $90,000 a month in payroll, $90,000 a month mm-hmm. in payroll that we know is not being efficiently used. Yeah. As, as it is right now. And yet yep. it felt like she needed to put time and energy and effort thinking about this $500. And it was just, it's kind of the elephant in the room of like, no, it's your labor. This is why you're, we're not yeah. as profitable as oh. we need to be, but you feel like you're doing something by cutting a fixed cost, like a, a fixed cost like that. But labor sometimes seems um, more difficult to really hone in on and maybe try to like tweak and change. So um, I, I'd be curious, like what, what you guys have done to sort of help people analyze mm-hmm. their labor and really decide you know, how, how do we make this, how do yeah. we make this ratio better? So, so in going back and reading the first book for the audio book version, it reminded me in the first book I used the, the, the overall labor efficiency calculation, which, so think about it this, for whatever bucket of labor that you're looking at, that's the denominator. So I'm going to talk fractions here. So numerator is the number on top, denominator is the number on the bottom of the fraction. So I've got some the, space here above and, and below. We might be able to put in some text there and give everybody a little bit more visual. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> and so, so mm-hmm. let's start with the most simple version that, especially if, if you're a 5 million and under business, this is a great place to start. And, and this is, this is a wild universal indicator. If I take all labor, regardless of its management or direct labor, and the one adjustment I would say it counts you at a market wage, whether you paid it or not. So you might have to make that adjustment. But I'm going to take all labor. That's my denominator. The first question you ask yourself is, what do I hold that labor accountable to? Hmm. What's the best number to hold it accountable to? Well, it's hmm. not revenue because like we said, revenue, oh, that's, a, that, that, that's not good. It's revenue minus cost of goods sold. That's not labor. You know, any hmm. of those pass through cost. And so I hold all labor accountable to gross margin. What's wild is 90% of the businesses that we see that if they can get to a $2 of gross margin for every dollar of management, a dollar of total labor, they're at 15% profit. Yeah. It is wild. And there's only a handful of outliers. Mm -hmm. Um, But man, it is so incredible. And so, it depends on how you process things as a thinker, as a business owner, that we find that that actually is the most effective technique of just giving them a salary cap. It says, mm-hmm. spend all the money you want on labor that you want. I just got to get $2 of gross margin for it every month. Yeah. And, and if I miss a month, I got to catch it up in the next month. And, and that is a powerful thing because if you go add a $100,000 position to, for management, Where's the two hundred thousand dollars in gross margin that's going to cover that? Exactly. Uh, I have a question on that. Do you include subcontractor costs? Like, if I, you know, say somebody like hired me as a virtual CFO, or mm. if, um, you know, you've you've got a graphic designer who's come in and done some work for you, do you include those types of costs too in your labor? So I, I general so I I count subcontractors as cost of goods sold. Mm-hmm. when they relate to the production of what I do as a business mm-hmm. for 
augmented staffing purposes of marketing and or um, uh, admin back office, I generally don't. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, unless it gets to be a, just a really, I mean, if, if, if you are full time, but contracted, yes, I'll throw it in the labor number. If you're fractional, I, I can kind of live without it. I mean, I, I don't, I don't need to get that, that specific, mm -hmm. uh, you know, with it. Typically it's not enough to, to drive the ratio that dramatically. And would you do like a loaded cost for an employee with also in benefits, no. retirement and all that? No, no, no. No, anti-allocation. Here's okay. the thing. And so when you allocate cost, that's a jobs program for accountants. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it, it's wasted effort. It takes, it's like taking a peanut, turning it into peanut butter and spreading it all over, you know, the page. Well, I, I you know, when it was peanuts, I could count them. When I spread mm -hmm. it out, I lose track of it. Mm -hmm. And 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 that's what I think the accounting, uh, the cost accounting people have just totally distorted people's understanding of cost control and value creation. Because think of it like this, if you really look at a standard business model, so we refer to it as the engine and the chassis. The engine of the business is really simple. It's three numbers, revenue minus cost of goods sold, which gets you to gross margin. And then gross margin minus direct labor is what we call contribution margin. Mm -hmm. It's what QuickBooks will call gross profit. We don't like the term gross profit, but we don't have time to get into that today. So <laughs> we, we call it we call it contribution margin. Mm -hmm. we, we use the word margin to represent a subset of a business activity. And, and that's that's an appropriate terminology. And so we believe contribution margin is the most important number on the P&L because it is the measurement of the horsepower of the business model. It's the output of the engine. Now, then we go to the chassis. Do you have a little pipsqueak chassis that can't handle the engine? Or do you have this big chassis that the engine's too small to pull? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let can we adjust that? And, you know, but that chassis is relatively stable. Now, it will, it will drift up with scale. But if you also drop revenue and margin production, it doesn't drop as fast as it goes up. And mm -hmm. we all saw that during COVID when some of us faced shutdowns and those things, um, you know, so, so, so I think as you look at that structure of that model, then it gives you this ability that if my operating expenses are relatively stable month in and month out with very few exceptions, well, now I know from the first day of the month, here's how much contribution margin I'm going to go get. Mm -hmm. I'll take it even one step further. 90 plus percent of the businesses have a fine, they have a, they know their fixed direct labor number every month. Mm -hmm. They don't flex labor. So I can even go one step further. I can take my operating expenses plus my direct labor that I'm currently committed to. And now I got a gross margin number. So this has been my war path for my presentations for the last couple of months. It's, Listen, guys, you are behind the curve. All right, so we're, we're sitting here on November the 5th. All right, I've let I've let you off for five days, but today, do you know how much this month's operating expenses and direct labor are likely to be, plus or minus five grand? That's not a hard thing to know. Mm -hmm. So now, do, now I I need to have a if I'm not going to lose money, I got to cover that that direct labor and opex number to at least break even. And then where do I stand one week into the month? We're, we've, we've just finished the first week of the month. Do we know where we stand today? Because I got three more weeks to do something about it. Yeah. And, 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 and when you get to the end of the month and, and then it takes a couple of weeks, 20 days, 30 days to then figure out what happened the previous month, you know, you're, you're, you're behind the game. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and it's the, the best picture I've seen of this is like you're driving down the road 60 miles an hour with a windshield that's blacked out and you're driving forward looking in the rearview mirror is your only indicator of where you're going. And that's a recipe Oof. for disaster. <laughs> no, thank you. I that's this is why we I mean, doing that planning. And I mean, I, what I always say is like the financials are a great indicator of like we look at them from the past, but they are certainly just a piece of everything. And we always need to be looking forward in everything that we're doing. But, you know, developing a forecast so that we can kind of know, 
hey, our, our fixed cost structure looks like this. Our current lever looks like this. We know we have to make $50,000 a month. We know we have to make $150,000 a month, whatever it mm -hmm. is. Yep. Knowing that number gives you actionable steps. You say, okay, what do I need to do to go out and get that $150,000 every single month? What do my projections look like? How much contracted work do I have now? And when does that yep. go away? And all of those things, I think it's really hard. Um, you know, and I think that's where a lot of small business owners maybe get a little bit um, discouraged because they don't have anybody on their team currently that's helping them do this. So then they, mm -hmm. they you know, so it's, sometimes this falls on their shoulders because they're looking to maybe their bookkeeper to be the person yep. that's going to tell them this stuff, but that's really not the role of the bookkeeper. No, no. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, and these are small amounts to pay to, to have mm -hmm. that, but I, I, I'll, I'll share with you this. I mean, so, so we, we merged uh, our practice with Car Riggs and Ingram in January of 20, right before COVID hit. And so, so I, I started my practice in 1986 and um, we merged then. And what I can tell you from having merged a year and a half ago is that I underperformed for the 30 previous years that I had my own practice. <laughs> and, and, and it's because of one simple word, accountability. And mm. so, and, and I, I have no excuse. I, I know how this stuff works. But there were times that because I was the, the majority owner of the firm I had, I had a couple of other partners and partners come and go over the years, but there were three of us partners when we merged. And, I mean, I could have done anything I wanted, but there's consequences to doing whatever you want. And, and, and those are economic consequences. And there were many times I just didn't want to deal with something and I accepted making less money because I didn't want to deal with it. Mm. I don't get that choice anymore. So as the partner in charge of the office, I have to give them a plan for the year and I can where our fiscal year in September 30th. And so we just finished that year and I can proudly say that we, we crushed it. We, we had our best year ever. We, we beat our revenue plan. We beat our profit plan. Awesome. And, and it's only because they're holding me accountable. So we started the beginning of the year last year. Uh, we were behind after the first three months. So our guys didn't come out of the gate after last tax season, like I wanted but we, but we kept pressing. And so every month, this is our sequence. We start the month knowing, well, here's the target for this month, but there's three levels of what we're trying to climb through. The first thing, first level is we want to bill more this month than what we build the same month of the previous year. Cause we don't mm -hmm. build the same amount across the year. Right. We, you know, we have seasonal deadline cycles just like mm -hmm. you do, you know, but, but if you're, if you're not seasonal, then that's great. But still the goal is, First thing to create ascendancy in business, beat the same month of the previous year. Mm -hmm. Second level is, did we reach our target for the month? And so that's step two. Step three is, if we have a, a deficit year to date for the plan, did we catch up? Mm -hmm. And then when we get a, we, we actually, we actually got ahead one month before the end of the year. So we actually got ahead at the end of August. And it's like, hey, let's keep going. Let's we are not going to to not beat this thing. And it's like, let's let's just set set a new standard. And and so one of my partners, you know, her her role is monitoring billing. And so each week she would say, you know, she first email comes out on the first day of the month, because we, we know this number. Mm -hmm. Here's the plan. A week into it. Okay, here's what we've built so far. So we build all of our fixed price monthly stuff in the first week. And so, okay, we've made this progress. Okay, what else? And then the next week, okay, here's where we stand. We've got two weeks to go. All right, what? And, and so what you're doing, and this is, this is an impact that we've seen from COVID. So there is a COVID hangover over the labor force that is like none I've ever seen. That, mm -hmm. and, I mean, and, and, and granted, yes, there, there's legitimate things that, that are impacting it. But a lot of it is just lazy excuses. And, and what's happening is, is people are using it as an excuse that if you have a disruption from a supply chain issue or this employee's out, oh, we'll take care of that next week. Or we'll let that slide to next month. Mm -hmm. And it's like, no, when we create a gap of availability, we got to reach into the future and pull something to the present. Mm -hmm. So here's my challenge to everybody listening to this today. Did you get everything done in the month of October that could have gotten done in the month of October and billed for it? Hmm. And the answer, is, the answer is no. And every, <laughs> yeah, there you go, there you go, Hannah. And and so, I, I have this wild fantasy about business. Hey, 
let's get everything done and we all take Friday off with pay. Yeah. Doesn't, how's yeah. that sound? I mean, and, and I think that's that it's more about productivity more than anything else. It's, it's not about, you know, sitting in your office for 40 hours and then magically work is going to happen. I mean, I work from home and it's really, it's very, very easy to either be super productive. I could be more productive in three hours than I can Mm -hmm. in an eight hour day sometimes, or I can waste days just not getting things done or procrastinating or putting things off. And it's like, it doesn't necessarily matter. I mean, depending on the type of work you're doing, of course. Yeah. But I mean, if I if I can always like scrunch down the work that I need to do and be highly productive, I mean that that's the ideal situation. It right. makes you feel better. You well, spend more time and, doing things you love. <laughs> and, and, and so part of it, one of the things I've actually talked about here in the last couple of days that is, you know, it's kind of like as we look at this, I'm always noodling on this and thinking of different ways to get people to think about it and, and shock them with it is, you know, is, is this mindset of a deadline culture, because th- this is very dominant in our profession as accountants. So, um, so I, 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 I do tax planning, but I do, I do not touch tax returns anymore. And, and so our consulting practice, we are busy on this basis like this 12 months out of the year. Every day it's scheduled. I do not have a to-do list. I have, a, you know, if, if it's a task or an appointment, it's on my calendar and I ain't, I ain't carrying around no to-do list. It, mm-hmm. It's like if some, somebody asks you to do something, the second question is when, and mm-hmm. it goes on the calendar. And then, mm-hmm. and then it, it's out of my mind. Our tax team, bless their little hearts, I mean, you know, they work stupid hours right around the deadlines. And I, and I keep telling them, I said, listen, guys, if you'll listen to me, we can take the season out of taxes. And, and, and the goal is it, you schedule the work. And, and if you schedule the work, you have absolute certainty of your capacity and when, you know, because when to say no. I mean, if, if, if I run out of capacity, the answer is, well, I'd love to do your tax return, but I got to help you find somebody else to do it because we, we just don't have any availability. Mm-hmm. And, and or we can get to it or, you know, here, here's the date that we can get to it. Mm-hmm. And and it's that. But if you don't th- this, it's like you were saying about the accounting thing of not hiring the accounting person or the controller, the fractional controller to help you put your numbers together. It's the same thing about calendar coordination. One of the most critical roles that we have in our, our, our office is our team coordinator for each of the production teams. And, and the, because of the way we calendar our consulting practice, it's our, our consulting coordinator that is a super valuable role and, and yeah. they're worth every dime we pay them. Absolutely. Because I, I mean, that's helping you be efficient. That's helping your mm-hmm. labor efficiency ratio that's right. that you're making sure you're not, you know, taking days before, oh, what we could have been working on that project, but it wasn't right. on our calendar. It wasn't on our radar. Right. So you just lost days of time that you're probably paying people on salary to do. So And, and, and so this is the first thing that happens when you when you, you become enlightened and go, OK, I need that person to help but you have to follow through with the second step. If I get that person to help and it frees up time, did I use the freed up time to move to the highest value task? Mm. That's mm-hmm. what's important. It's not about being busy. It's about highest value people doing the highest value task. Exactly. And, and, and you have to fill up from there and work backwards rather than, um, you know, filling up, you know, I mean, we, we see this in our labor efficiency analysis of, of companies where we have the data that that person who's a high paid person, who's always talking about how busy they are. Yeah. But they're not very profitable. You know, you're mm-hmm. not, you're, you're busy doing stuff that a person at half your pay rate or, or less could do. Mm-hmm. That That's not good. You know. <laughs> Definitely not. And I mean, you know, you, you demonstrated this even in like me reaching out and to get mm-hmm. an appointment to do this. You were like, here, talk to my admin. Like they'll, they'll get it set up. <laughs> and I think I, that's I, a perfect example of living this, you know, you're not going to be going there looking at your calendar or whatever, like leave it to the person whose job that is. And that's fine. Yeah, I, had a 50, I had a 15 second response and then I'm, yeah. I'm done with it. And <laughs> you're like, sure. Okay. whatever. <laughs> you know, um, uh, 
that for solopreneurs, like one really awesome tool is mm -hmm. these calendaring tools that you mm -hmm. can have now. How much time did I save when I first started just sending somebody a link to book my calendar, not this like back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So, you know, using these, we have tons of productivity tools, tons mm -hmm. of things that can help us um, between either labor or, um, or if it is a software tool, we have so, a lot. So one thing I will say about that, because we, we've had a very robust debate about that in our office. And I will, mm -hmm. you know, so this goes back into, so when you, when the first thing I say in the 2.0 book is I start it with my three simple rules of business success. The first rule is figure out what the market needs, mm -hmm. not what they want, because if you go do market research, they'll tell you what they want, but they'll lie to you. You got to you got to discern what do they need. And then the second rule is, you know, the, uh, of business success is I got to then find a way to do it profitably, which we think is the easiest thing to figure out. And then the third rule is of the profit that I generate and what I have to invest to make it happen. I got to get a minimum 50 percent return on investment year in, year out. And so of, if I have to invest five hundred thousand to get my business going, to cover AR inventory minus AP and those things. If that net investment is 500,000, my minimum profit target has to be 250,000. I don't care mm -hmm. what industry you're in. It, mm -hmm. it, it, that That's what our research tells us is our minimum acceptable number. The average business in the US is 75 to 100%. We got quite a few that are well over 100%. Mm -hmm. So how many of us would like 100% return on investment year in and year out on something? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, that's pretty spiffy. And, mm -hmm. and so that first thing of, of want versus need, I'll give you a good example. Francis Fry wrote the book Uncommon Service. And Francis, I, I'm, I generally kind of crack on uh, uh, college professors that talk about business because they've never made a payroll in their life. But Fra Francis is a rock star. I mean, she's 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 an awesome person. I've got to hear her in person a few times. And and that that book Uncommon Service is, is one of the ones we highly recommend. But she did she did some work with Commerce Bank up in the Northeast back in the 2000s, and they were the fastest growing bank in the region. And they did market research and they said, what does the customers want? Well, they want high interest rates on deposits and savings accounts. Well, they had the highest growth rate and paid the least amount of interest on those deposits. So why did that happen? Well, they figured out that what they really needed was to be open on Saturdays and Sundays. Hmm. And now, why does that matter about what you said about calendaring? It depends on your service offering. And so what mm -hmm. you've got to look at your customers that, you know, we've got clients who, who I, I've come to the belief at, at the moment, I might can change this over time. I, our clients do not want self-service calendaring because mm -hmm. a lot of times we're doing complex scheduling, oh, we're yeah. scheduling multiple people. Mm -hmm. Now, the calendar calendar uh, app is is great for a one to one calendar, mm -hmm. you know, pick or something like that. And mm -hmm. and there are times it can work, but just be careful that once again, you know, what is it that that customer really needs to take action? Mm -hmm. And as much as uh, you know, our clients in, have good intention, our our consulting coordinator has to work really hard and make multiple attempts at times to get people to send us the data, to update their model, to schedule the call and, and you know, and make a decision on what time slot, because those time slots go I and mean, you, you don't jump on it. it it's gone because there's high demand and, and they'll get upset that, that, hey, I, you know, we can't get in. Well, you know, we, we emailed you three weeks ago and you, you didn't <laughs> commit to a slot. And, and, and so um, people will not natively you know, respond to things that's in their best interest. And so if you want to be the best helper, you've got to discern what are those things that I can add as a value add service mm -hmm. to push them to do what's best, you know, for them because they won't always natively do it. Yeah, absolutely. That's a good point. Yeah. Well, I know we're running up on our time yep. here. So yeah, I right. wanted to see if you could, if you could maybe give us one recommendation if somebody could do one thing today or this month to make their business better from a financial perspective, what would be that top thing? Yeah. I mean, the, the thing that I've seen unequivocally is what I said earlier about know what your monthly operating expenses are, add your direct labor to it, 
and now start monitoring weekly your success towards hitting that gross margin goal every week throughout the month. Mm-hmm. And, and if your cost of goods sold are kind of hard to calculate, I mean, it's probably a good, a, a, a guess is better than no data at all. Mm-hmm. And, and that's what I, I really want to, to, to speed up people's understanding. You cannot wait, as, as I, coming from my farming background, uh, you know, when the cow's done left the barn, it's too late to shut the gate. And if you wait until the end of the month to look back at what happened, you can't do anything about it. Mm-hmm. And I, 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 I'm doing a presentation, and don't feel bad for me, I'm doing a presentation in Maui uh, on Monday, so i got to leave tomorrow. <laughs> uh, so, But it's it's not as glamorous as it sounds because it's mostly I'm flying there, sleeping, getting up, doing the presentation, getting on a plane, flying back. Oh. And so, so it's, <laughs> it's, uh, I, you know, but, but in that group, we did a pre-survey of the group, mm-hmm. and, and 50% of the, these are HVAC companies uh, that are attending this, 50% of them cannot track gross margin throughout the month as it's being built. And th- these are, these are 10 to $50 million businesses. Wow. It's like, guys, come on. Yeah. Yeah. That's the, I mean, that's just such a critical number. So I think that's a great recommendation without knowing what expenses you have to cover, you know, you're going to be like you said, kind of driving blind on that. So I, yeah. I really appreciate that. I think that is a really, really good recommendation for everybody. And that's regardless of industry. That's yes, it is. Uh, the yeah. board, no matter what, um, if you can know that number, you are going to be in a better place. So, Absolutely. well, Greg, thank you so much for taking this time and yeah, enlightening us having. with all of this, because it's been so good. So, Again, the simple numbers, straight talk. We'll put a link to it in the description box below. I also want to thank you just for all of your work with EO. Um, I'm in the accelerator program. And um, so, and then also you happen to be contributing to this book too. So this is kind of our like Bible for EOA Mm -hmm. for the accelerator. And I just, I appreciate all the work that you're doing to help entrepreneurs because, you know, we're super smart people, but we need help in all these, (laughs) you know, we have strengths and then sometimes numbers aren't our strengths. So we really appreciate it. Last time I checked, there's not any smart people that didn't get to where they are without the help of others, you know, so, you know, so I think, you know, as we all kind of band together, I, you know, it, it, I'm really struck by the impact that, you know, when we help clients really succeed in their business, uh, we always like to say we, we specialize in 15 year overnight successes. And, and <laughs> we've, we, we've had a few of those that those are super rewarding to see somebody work so hard and they just keep hitting the wall, hitting the wall, hitting the wall. And it's like, boom, it breaks. And it's mm-hmm. like, that is so sweet to see. That's great. Awesome. Well, thank you again for sharing all of your experiences and um, yeah, have a good, good rest deal. of your all day. Right. Well, th- all thanks right. for having me, Hannah. Keep, keep in touch. Awesome. Well, again, I just want to say thanks so much to Greg for coming, taking this time out of his busy, busy schedule to talk to us today. We really, really appreciate it. And again, you guys, if you want to grab this book or if you've already gotten this one and you're ready to next level, take it to the next level. And you guys, these are tips that really you know, they're applicable for any business, but they will really help you as you scale past a million dollars and you go way beyond in your business. You have to have a firm foundation in your numbers in order to get to the next level. All right. So you guys have a wonderful day. I hope you enjoyed that. And again, leave a like if this was helpful and please, please feel free to leave us comments and questions in the comment section below. All right. Bye everyone.